Okay. Hello, everybody, and happy Tuesday. Welcome to uh, the monitoring of sedated patients in the ICU from the RTSO. So it is just three o'clock. We know people are going to be logging on as they're um, able to. We're very fortunate today to have with us Dr. Mata, who's come um, over from, I believe he's in the UK, but Massimo was able to link us with this uh, speaker for today. So just before we get into his talk, um, I'm just going to, sorry, give me a sec, guys, turn off my camera. Okay, so that you guys can see, can you guys see my screen okay? I can't see anything. You can't see anything. That's exciting. Uh, you can hear, so that's a good start. There we go. Yeah, we can see a screen now. Perfect. Little technical glitches. All right. So I just want to introduce the RTSO board. You guys have seen this a few times now if you've been following. So uh, we have our voting members and our non-voting members. So I'm Kelly, I'm the, the president currently. Sue Jones is our past president. We have Gino, who's a director at large. Sue Martin, who's our treasurer. Farzad, who does all of our media. Shauna, who does all of our airwaves stuff. We have, um, all right, Wendy uh, there, and then Sylvia, and then we have Megan, who's joined us as secretary. And on the other side, we have our non-voting members as well everyone working hard um, to help support you during these times. And I just want to give a shout out. So a few weeks ago, we did talk about the food drive that was started by um, the RTs in South Lake. So we did challenge RTs from across Ontario to raise funds. And so we have over the past few weeks over our social media, um, we've seen that uh, the RTs and AAs in Miss Mississauga have uh, raised over $2,000. We've seen that sick kids went ahead and raised uh, $2,800. The RTs in St. Joe's have uh, gone ahead and raised around $2,300. And we know that there's ongoing efforts at Sunnybrook. I think there's somewhere around 3,000. Oakville, somewhere around 2,500. And Michael Guerin has gone for the whole hospital. So great work, everybody. Uh, please continue to send that in. Let us know how you're doing. So we can keep a tally. And the hashtag that everybody's been using is hashtag uh, HCWS, healthcare workers for food. Also I want to take a huge uh, moment to give you a huge thanks for all the work that you're doing. Um, so here's some pictures that have been kind of shared over social media of RTs from across the province, in addition to an RT daughter who's very proud of her mom um, that was in a video recently. So you guys are all doing some amazing work and we're super um, proud and excited to be here on the journey with you and recognizing you for everything that you're doing. We are currently representing uh, RTs across Ontario on two ministry tables, so the collaborative table and the communication table, trying to bring some of your concerns forth to the ministry and get answers for you. And we do attend a ministry call every morning. We also have uh, Tony who's working with a group to look at some pulmonary function recommendations, and we're reaching out to other areas as well to try and ensure that we're providing support across the continuum of care. So thank you very much for everyone for everything that you're doing. And now we're going to hand it over to Massimo. So we do have on the line Becky, and Becky's going to introduce um, what we're speaking about as well as our speaker. Hi everyone, it's Becky Mueller. I am a respiratory therapist in Ontario and an RTSO member. I'm also a clinical specialist uh, covering southwestern Ontario for Massimo. Um, so I do clinical support on a number of our products. Um, at the bedside and what we're uh, presenting today with our esteemed colleague Dr. Basil Mata is a look into sedation in the ICU. I know it's a very hot topic with respiratory therapists especially now during um, the COVID pandemic and so we thought it was very timely to invite him to speak to all of you. Um, so thank you Dr. Mata and I'll pass it on to you. Great. Well, uh Good afternoon to all of you, uh, and thank you very much for asking me to give this lecture. I'm going to try and share my screen now. Is that the next trick? That is the next trick. Okay. Am I sharing my screen? Yes, yes I see it. Looks beautiful. It? Okay. okay. So, can you still see it? Excellent. Okay, well, I hope, first of all, that you and your families are safe and well, and thank you all for all that you're doing, uh, putting yourselves and your families at risk, really, to save lives in, in this really unprecedented world crisis. 
Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, as, uh, as Becky said, I, I'm Basil Mata. I'm a consultant in anesthesia and uh, neurotrauma at Cambridge University Hospitals and part-time uh, senior medical director for Massimo. I, like many of you, have been dealing with COVID patients in the ICU over the past several weeks. And I'm hoping in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an overview of how we can protect the brain in COVID patients, uh, those admitted to ICU, uh, by optimizing sedation and making sure that oxygenation to the brain is maintained. Now, <clears throat> I also would like to thank Sue Jones and Kelly Hassel, also Becky and Miles Smith from for Massimo for making this webinar possible. Now, this is Cambridge University Hospital, a sprawling metropolis. And uh, the last 20 years, I've been really looking after patients who suffered a brain injury. And as I get older, I'm uh, worried more and more about my brain. And I really want to prevent brains from getting injured and hopefully do that over the next 20 years or so. Now, COVID is a respiratory tract infection, or at least that's what we think it is. You know, the coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that cause illnesses from a wide variety of things from a common cold to the Middle East respiratory syndrome, the MERS, which was emerged in 2012 in Saudi Arabia, and the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, which was the COVID-1 in 2003 in South China. Now, the new COVID-19 is a new strain, not being previously identified in humans, and it was first really detected in Wuhan in 2019 in China, and the infection has spread uh, really remarkably quickly to over 85 countries around the world. And the most severely hit has been Italy, with about 250,000 patients infected, Spain, with about 240,000, the United Kingdom, with 250, and the US, with about 1.5 million so far. Now, in Canada, you guys have been lucky. You've only had about 80,000 and about 5,700 deaths in total. Now, what have we learned about this virus so far? Well, we know it's an airborne virus, but the unusual thing about it is it can live on surfaces for a very long time, up to 72 hours, which is most unusual for a virus. A virus normally lives for about a few hours. People are infectious early in the disease before they realize they have got the disease, and many are really truly asymptomatic. There's no evidence of reinfection once you've recovered, and viral shedding continues for days after recovery, not just in your breath, but also in feces and, and, uh, and, and uh, coughing and uh, uh, saliva and sputum. The transmission seems to occur mainly in the household and transmission in schools has been very, very low. And the children seem to get infected, but don't seem to develop severe disease. Although there is this uh, inflammatory syndrome that's been described in the last couple of weeks, but we're not quite sure whether this is related to COVID or not, because some patients have tested positive and some patients have tested negative to COVID. The measures that have worked and we know have worked is quarantining, social distancing, and isolation. This idea of herd immunity really hasn't caught on because for us to develop herd immunity, we need to get about 50% of the population to be infected. And with the percentage death that is seen with this disease, this would be catastrophic. So the virus can spread very quickly and can, can be fatal. Over 5 million people have been infected worldwide and more than 300,000 deaths. The overall case fatality is low. It ranges from about 1% to over 10% in some countries. And as I said, 85% of patients have mild symptoms and recover without any intervention at all. The ICU mortality is very scary. It's close to 50% in finished episodes. It ranges from about 20% in those under 40 years of age to over 70% in those over 70 years of age. Interesting about this virus is that we're seeing a lot of thromboembolism. About 30% of patients are developing pulmonary emboli, multiple pulmonary emboli. We're seeing myocarditis, which is not unusual, and renal dysfunction in about 25% of those patients. The morbidity and mortality increases with age and comorbidities, and in particular, obesity and diabetes. They seem to be quite a, a selecting uh, uh, sort of a reason for you having a high morbidity and mortality if you have diabetes and, and obese. And those who come in, admitted into intensive care have organs supported. Not surprisingly, almost half require basic respiratory support, a bit of oxygen, maybe a bit of NIV. Advanced support, about 70%. Cardiovascular support, basic, 92%. Renal support in 22%. And neurologic support in 5 to 6% of patients. 
Now, what are the common signs of infection? Fever is supposed to be the commonest, but now we're beginning to realize that actually a new persistent cough is very important. Shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, wheeze, hoarseness, sore throat, even a non-persistent cough with nasal discharge or congestion, and interestingly enough, loss of sense of smell. The more cases obviously develop pneumonia, which can be severe, cause ARDS and death. Other things that have been reported, as has already said, myocarditis, renal failure, coagulation abnormalities, and the all uh, killer in ICU multi-organ failure. So you're really interested in patients who come to critical care. So COVID-19 is a disease of oxygenation, or at least we think it is. And admission is generally to monitor and improve oxygenation in those patients. So how do you improve oxygenation? Well, very simple. You supplement oxygen in those spontaneously ventilating. You give supplemental oxygen a little bit more forceful with high flow nasal oxygen. You can give supplemental oxygen using CPAP or NIV. And if all of those fail, you end up doing intubation mechanical ventilation. Now, we in Cambridge chose not to use CPAP, high flow or non-invasive ventilation because we could not guarantee that those patients will not be spreading the virus to healthcare workers around them. So we chose not to use those unless we were in negative pressure room and the, pay, and the staff were in PPE. Now I'm going to show you this, this uh, interesting uh, patient uh, diagrams, if you like. So if you look at the top slide here, there is, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the respiratory rate. This is a patient who comes in, respiratory rate, 12, 13, and starts to go up over a period of days. And you can see it's rising gently until it gets to about, you know, almost 40 in day two, day three. At the same time, you can see what's happening to this patient. They're blowing off their carbon dioxide. They're hyperventilating all the time. Hyperventilating, hyperventilating, hyperventilating. They're becoming quite alkalotic. And the reason for that is because as you get hypoxic, the brain doesn't like it, and you start hyperventilating. And you don't feel unwell with this. You feel a bit tired, a bit fuzzy, but I'm not too bad. And this is what we call the sort of silent hypoxia thing. Patients don't feel bad until they get to the end where they can no longer breathe any faster and compensate for the hypoxia and they fall off a cliff. And so that's why the concern has been about all of these patients who've got saturations of 85, 86% sitting at home feeling, I'm okay, but breathing very fast and suddenly they collapse and end up uh, very, very ill indeed. So when you bring patients into ICU, is sedation necessary? Well, if you, if you look at why we, we sedate patients, because intubation, is, is the tube is really irritating in your, in your cords and in your airway, so you need to sedate them to tolerate the tube. You can improve uh, ventilator patient synchrony uh, in, in severe respiratory failure, and sometimes you may require muscle relaxants, and so you're worried about awareness. The surgical conditions may require that you sedate them, for example, if they've had abdominal injuries or chest injuries or plastic surgery or flaps, so you may want to uh, uh, ventilate them and sedate them for that. And you know, people who've got stiff septicus, they need to be controlled. And of course, those who come in for traumatic brain injury, subacute hemorrhage, or any other neurologic injury that require uh, sedation and control of their ICP. But remember, sedation is not the treatment. It's just something that facilitates what we want to do to these patients. So sedation is critically ill. Really, we are all moving away from the idea that you need high-dose sedatives. We're talking about now, the, the, the rather than the conventional sedation uh, paradigm, we're talking about, uh, excuse me for a second, we're talking about uh, 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 really using, providing necessary analgesia and only using sedative so that the patient can still be aroused and be responding. And we need to move away from benzodiazepine, reduce benzodiazepine, because that's the one drug, I suppose, really, that's been heavily implicated in terms of developing delirium in the ICU. And delirium in the ICU is really bad. You know, up to 50, 60 percent of patients develop delirium. It increases length of stay. It increases mortality. It increases dependency on the ventilator. It increases all sorts of things and leaves a horrible feeling for the patient afterwards. So this is a, a sort of, if you like, a, a protocol where you you aim to make sure they're pain-free with either fentanyl, hydromorphine, or morphine, and you go through and continuously reassess the, the, uh, the sedation to make sure they are pain-free, sedated, but able to respond. No. 
and there's a variety of scores really for, for physiotherapy patients in ICU and the RAS score is the most uh, commonly used Richmond agitation sedation score and it goes from alert and calm at zero all the way to plus four when they're combative, violent, trying to pull the lines out, trying to move out of the bed to unarousable, to my, which is minus five, no response to films or stimulation. And really what we do and try and aim to keep them between you know, really minus one and plus one at most, really. If you like light sedation and drowsy, minus one to minus two is where you really ideally want them to be, opening eyes to command, nice and calm, cooperative, but still being able to be ventilated. And the RAS score has been adapted, multiple uses. You know, you can use it in pedi pediatric patients for delirium. You can use it as part of the uh, confusion assessment method in the ICU, the CAM ICU. And it's been used worldwide really now in terms of a, an assessment for, for sedation. But it is very objective and it does require that you wake up the patient or keep the patient at least awake. So it doesn't really work in patients who are heavily sedated for, for reasons, uh, for medical reasons, or have been paralyzed in order to ventilate them. So the Alfred ICU in Melbourne has got a very good protocol and they go on about five stages of, of sedation in the ICU. They, must, they say really, you must have a protocol. You can't just have sedation willy nilly. Anybody can use anything. You really have to have a sedation analgesia protocol incorporating RAS and the CAM ICU. Use analgesia first because patients don't all necessarily need sedatives. They need pain relief, okay? Target a desired sedation score and stick to it. Measure it repeatedly. Avoid excessive sedation because it, as I said, if you over sedate the patients, they get delayed extubation, they increase length of stay, they increase mortality, they get a terrible quality of sleep and they increase the incidence of delirium. And use the right medication for the right patient. Most patients are okay with morphine. TBI, neurologic injury, you may want to use fentanyl. Those who've been sedated for a short period of time, you may want to use remifentanyl. And don't forget the second line analgesics, like ketamine, dexamethamidine, paracetamol, clonidine, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and try and avoid or limit the use of benzodiazepine because they tend to cause the worst delirium in ICU patients. Now let's talk about COVID patients because it's very topical. You know, the management of COVID patients, and people describe two types of patients. I don't think they're two types of patients. I think they're the type of patient presenting at different times in their illness. So we talk about type L uh, uh, COVID patient, which is the, the basically the patient who comes in, have a high minute ventilation, low volume, good compliance. So these patients haven't got a problem with, with ventilation. They can breathe in that very fast. The lungs are compliant. They can move big tidal volumes. They suck in air at minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 centimeters of water. And the CT shows, you know, infiltrates that look like grand class. And this is the early stage, I think, of ARDS or, or COVID patients. And then you get the type H, which is the more typical of ARDS patients. They've got extensive consolidation on CT. They've got poor compliance. The lungs don't expand very well. Higher lung volume as estimated by CT. And these people tend to respond to PEEP much, much better than the first group which doesn't really respond to PEEP at all. And this is how it happens. Basically, you get the hypoxia, you start breathing fast, your vessels stretch, you suck in fluid into your, into your lungs and cause edema, you worsen your oxygenation, and you get intubated. And that is the way it goes. The people who are just hypoxemic can often be supported with increased oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, and avoid intubation if possible. Those that have developed a type H already tend to require intubation because those mechanisms don't tend to work in those patients. Now, sedation, and there's, there's phases of illness in the ICU. And if you try to superimpose this here, based on ARDS onto the, the COVID patients, you can see that there's the early phase where sedation requires to be quite deep actually, and, uh, and because it requires you to really ventilate the patient. So you're using uh, neuromuscular blockers, you may turn them prone, uh, compliance is very poor. You have to give them a, quite a deep sedative in order to maintain all of that. And then as they begin to get better, they need to move into the second phase where you are actually lightening the sedation and beginning to stop the paralysis and maintain them in a lighter plane of sedation to make sure that uh, you know the patient is comfortable but they're still able to tolerate the ventilation or ventilatory support and eventually they may end up requiring a tracheostomy or or uh, or ventilator synchrony would be fine for them 
So how do you measure sedation if you can't wake up the patient? And you know, uh, this has been around for years. You, you have a raw EEG, it's too complicated, too difficult. How the hell are we going to measure all this stuff? You, some clever people, clever scientists, clever electrophysiologists, bring it all into a funnel and come out with these, with these parameters, DSA, PSI, uh, spectral edge, spectral edge frequency, all of those things that, that measure. And then it gives you a measure of how sedation is progressing. Now we know that if you look at the slide here, there's burst suppression. Now burst suppression means when, you, when your brain is active, there's no burst suppression. Your brain is active all the time, and the neurons are communicating with each other all the time. When your sedation becomes too deep, what the neurons do is they, they fire, and then they stop, then they fire, and then they stop. And so effectively what happens is that your, your, your brain is not communicating with itself all the time. It's just keeping the housekeeping functions. And that is too deep a sedation. You don't need to be in burst suppression. And the, and the sideline machine can show you the suppression ratio. We should stay away from them. The PSI is the patient state index, which goes from zero to 100. And the patient state is on intensive care. Really, most people will try and stay above 30. I would say most patients in intensive care need 40 to 50 to 60. Any, any lower than that is not necessary unless you want them deeper sedated, maybe around 30. So over sedation, we know in ICU is, is bad. But do you think the patient 19, COVID-19 patients are going to get over sedated? Of course they are. Of course they are. Can you imagine how difficult it is to intubate somebody with that virus running around? We need a special intubation team, PPE. Uh, they're very critically dependent on the ventilator. The last thing you want is for them to self-extubate. So the staff want to make sure these patients are well sedated and paralyzed. So actually, they don't self-extubate or they're not too light. And this has all the undesirable effects we already said. Longer ICU stay, cardiac depression, increased mortality. There's not enough ICU beds. If you increase the length of stay, by definition, you reduce the number of ICU beds available. And as you sedate these patients, which we, we saw regularly, we started switching from sedatives and inotropes and pumps because we're running out of prep for 1%, so we go to 2%. We're running out of 2%, so we go to ketamine. We're running out of ketamine. Inotropes are the same running out of noradrenaline, so we use vasopressin, running out of vasopressin, so, you know, metaraminol, and pumps, there aren't enough pumps. So really, over-sedating these patients is not just about uh, reducing uh, the, 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 the better outcome and increasing their ICU state, but actually it has effects on other patients because you can't use drugs and inotropes and pumps on them. So excessive profound sedation is a problem in mechanically ventilated patients, and it is so much so in COVID-19 ARDS patients. Now, this is, this is some data from, from, uh, from Frank Rizzullo in, in uh, Italy. He looked at 11 COVID patients. I've looked at a similar number, but I haven't analyzed the data yet. And he's shown that actually 50% of the patients sedated in their ICU had a PSI less than 30. 73% had most of the time, half of the time, below PSI of 30. So you can see these patients do not need to be this sedated. But they are. But how would you know if you weren't measuring objectively the depth of sedation? Now, depth sedation monitoring, uh, uh, as I am uh, part of Massimo, I need to talk to you about the Massimo Z line. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Massimo Z line. It's a very clever piece of kit. It it's, uses a montage, that shoves in the EEG, and four leads, and then analyzes it and comes up with the patient state index. But you can also see the spectral edge. You can see DSA, you can see uh, burst suppression, you can see the suppression ratio. So you can have a lot of information there. But to be honest with you, if you're using it for sedation and intensive care, you probably would be get away by, by using a PSI and, and glancing at the DSA every now and then. It's not a difficult machine to use at all. Now, we have to remember we need to protect the brain in all ICU patients, but in particular, the COVID patients, we have three groups of patients, at least, that come through the door that end up with COVID. Those COVID patients with that pre-existing brain injury who come in, young and healthy before infection, they have a high risk of brain injury because they're hypertensive, cerebrovascular disease, cardiac disease, whatever. So they may have a pre-existing condition. Those patients that come in with COVID that have a pre-existing brain injury, such as people who've had previous strokes, tumors, or carotid disease. So we admitted quite a lot of our neurosurgical patients from the neurosurgical floors into the intensive care, not because of the neurosurgical disease, but because they contracted COVID. And then you have non-COVID patients who come in, trauma, 
GBI, subarachnoid hemorrhage, strokes, who come in without COVID but end up being infected on the ICU. And no matter how careful you are and how many times you change your mask and gloves, open doors and close doors, some of these patients eventually get infected. And that's why we have to protect the brain in these patients, because all of those patients, the brain is at risk in them. Now, if you remember, the brain is a very clever piece of kit. It has a normal physiology. The metabolism is very coupled to blood flow. So when the blood flow goes up, metabolism goes up. When the metabolism goes down, blood flow goes down. Now, the problem is if those things don't match. So if you have the flow going up beyond the metabolism or the flow staying up beyond the metabolism coming down, you get hyperemia and cerebral edema. And if your blood flow does not keep up with metabolism, such as somebody seizing, or you reduce the blood flow more than you reduce the, the, uh, the metabolism, you get ischemia and, and brain damage. So we need to stay in this area. We match the blood flow to metabolism as much as possible. Now, how do we do this? Well, blood coming to the brain is fully oxygenated. It goes in and comes out through the jugular vein. And most people consume about, uh, you know, 25% uh, of the oxygenated delivered blood to the brain that comes out. So you shove in 100%, and generally speaking, the juggle of ox saturations runs around 70 to 75%. That's all the blood draining through the right and left uh, juggler bulb. But remember, it's not all about oxygen delivery. It's also about oxygen consumption. So if you look at oxygen delivery, what governs your oxygen delivery? Hemoglobin, how well saturated the hemoglobin and the partial pressure of oxygen. But that's a small amount, okay? That's your arterial content. And then once that blood is oxygenated, you have to drive it around to deliver the oxygen. And that depends on your cardiac output, which depends on your heart rate and stroke volume. So this is the oxygen delivery. So one could argue that we do not transfuse patients in intensive care when they have a hemoglobin above 70 or above 7. But if you're worried about oxygen delivery and you can't saturate them to 100% and you saturate them at 90, an increase of a gram of hemoglobin or two grams can really increase 20, 30% your oxygen delivery to that vital organ. So it's not all about uh, uh, saturation. Sometimes the actual oxygen content is what matters and you may have to transfuse people earlier if you can't oxygenate them than, than, than you would otherwise do. And in terms of oxygen delivery, what happens is that you deliver oxygen, and if you start to drop your oxygen delivery, the brain is clever. It just extracts more, extracts more. So you keep dropping your delivery, and the brain keeps extracting more. Until you get to a point where the brain can't extract anymore, you've reached the limit of extraction. And that's when the extraction can't work anymore, okay? And that's when you start anaerobic metabolism and your lactate begins to rise. And this is the critical oxygen delivery point. So you need to be able to deliver oxygen to the point where extraction is possible to compensate for reduction in delivery. So if we can't oxygenate the brain better, if we can't deliver more oxygen to the bladder, how can we reduce demand? Well, it's very simple. You sedate them appropriately, you control the temperature because pyrexia really consumes the, the brain oxygen and prevents seizures. And we know that said line can, can help you uh, optimize uh, sedation. And we know cerebral oximetry, uh, which I will talk about in a second, can, can ensure that the end organ is getting enough oxygenation. So you optimize sedation. By optimizing sedation, you match metabolism to flow, so you reduce oxygen consumption. You prevent over sedation, and you can use muscle relaxants if you like. You can serve drugs, you reduce myocardial depression, and as a result, you don't have to use as much inotropes, and you save your pumps. And you can detect and prevent injury. You know, if, you, if you're monitoring uh, the EEG, you can detect seizures. If you're using O3, you can protect brain desaturations. And we know there's a lot of evidence now to suggest that if you desaturate on your cerebral oximetry by more than 15% from baseline, you're likely to have a worse outcome in terms of delirium, in terms of POCD, and in terms of length of stay. And beyond COVID, we need to think beyond COVID, the delirium, the post-ICU syndrome, and stroke. All of those things, over-sedation, uh, poor oxygenating in the brain leads to an increase in delirium, post ICU syndrome, and even stroke. So cerebral oximetry, just to give you a run through that, it's a very clever little device. It's been around for 20 years uh, and more. But this is a really much better, much improved system. So you shine a light source, well, four wavelengths, and there are two real arcs, one deep and one shallow. 
The deep one goes through the brain tissue. The shallow one acts as, if you like, as a cyta. It tells you through the superficial tissue. And you subtract the signals from both of those, and you calculate the amount of uh, uh, the the amount of oxygen in that piece of tissue underneath you. So, so what you are assuming is that 75% of that is venous and 25% of that is arterial. So it is calculating, if you like, the balance between the oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. So if you don't deliver enough oxygen, what will happen is the, and for the same consumption, the oxygen saturation will drop. And if you deliver too much oxygen, the saturation will go up. And there's a couple of other clever little uh, indices that have been added to the system now uh, that talk about uh, oxygenated, the oxygenated and total hemoglobin, and if you look at those carefully and look at the changes in those, you can work out why the saturation is changing. Is it changing because blood flow is going up? Is it changing because the consumption is going up? Is it changing because there's venous congestion? And we know venous congestion in ICU causes fuzziness and is responsible for quite a lot of uh, feeling of unwellness afterwards, especially in cardiac and liver transplantation. Now, we always talk about monitoring vital organs and anesthesia in critical care. And these are your vital organs, okay? Heart, lungs, brain, kidneys, liver. You can't live without these, okay? But it's really strange. We monitor every other organ other than one organ that we actually use drugs and techniques to sedate. All our sedatives work on the brain, and yet it's about the only organ we don't really routinely monitor. And it's strange because we continue to focus the least and what is arguably the most important organ where anesthetic drugs work and once it's injured you can't really transplant it or heal it and we really need to be thinking about the brain more and more rather than less and less so to summarize what i've said we really must optimize patient care to ensure brain well-being in this crisis it would be an absolute tragedy if your patients recover from this serious illness of covid 19 only to find themselves nursing a brain injury. Can't remember the name, or have a stroke, or have delirium. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mata. That was very informative. Um, for anybody that has any questions, we do have a question box that's uh, on the side of your screen where you can type your questions in, and then I'm able to read them out to Dr. Mata or also to uh, Becky, who's on the line. Becky, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. You do want to, you don't have to, but you can share your screen. So, um, while we're waiting. Do you, do you want me to switch my screen off or go back to your screen? Oh, yeah, I can share my screen, not a problem. I have a question for Dr. Mata, if that's okay, Kelly. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Dr. Mata, can you just describe what your current practice is when a patient is admitted to ICU? Is it Has it become your standard of care to, to do brain monitoring on all patients that are gonna be mechanically ventilated, or is it up to the admitting physician uh, to make that choice? Uh, two, two things. Uh, we are a neurocritical care unit, so our patients are generally monitored the brain is monitored continuously. We use triple bolt, so we put a, a PO2 probe inside the the, uh, the frontal lobe. We put microdialysis catheters, and we put in uh, 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 an ICP monitor and PO2 probe. So we monitor the brain quite comprehensively because most of these patients are neurologically injured. We are beginning to monitor the patients who are not neurologically injured more and more often with Sedline and O3. Uh, and the reason we monitor those is because uh, the patient who's neurologically injured has got an injury, and we know what we're monitoring. We scan them regularly. When somebody comes in multiple trauma and they haven't got a brain injury, we're not going to drill a hole in the head and put a triple bolt in. So we use a non-invasive sensor that gives us information about that. The critical cares in, in the UK are really uh, run by, by the intensivists, not by the admitting physicians. And so we tend to make a decision about what we want to sedate and what we want to monitor. If we require a triple bolt, we ask the surgeons to come and put one in. But actually, we work as a multidisciplinary team, uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the question the question comes up is, you know, it's a sticker. It's on the forehead, okay? Compared to everything else we're doing for them in intensive care, what is the harm in knowing 
something that you don't know. Because otherwise you're flying blind. You've no idea what you're doing, really. Can you describe some challenges that you've had with cloning your patients when doing brain monitoring simultaneously? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Uh, when you're probing a patient in the ICU uh, with the brain monitor sticker on, is there any tip troubleshooting you've noticed that you can share with us? We have a system called ICM Plus, so we've developed this over the past 20 years, and what the ICM Plus system does, it collects all the information from the brain monitoring and plots it out. And so we dynamically calculate autoregulation, we dynamically calculate the best uh, sedation score, we dynamically calculate the best perfusion pressure for that individual patient. We genuinely give individualized treatment. So our nurses uh, and our, our, our team in the ICU know how to alter the blood pressure and sedation based on those algorithms. And we have simplified them, so green, orange, red. When the patient's algorithm is showing green, it means everybody is in the right zone. When it's showing orange, it means something is amiss. And when it's showing red, it means something needs to be uh, intervened. And, and the clinicians intervene regularly when, when they see red. Thank you. We do have a couple. To be honest with you, there is no point having a monitor where A, the people looking after the patient 24 hours a day, which are the nurses, uh, don't believe in. And when a monitor changes and the clinicians don't do anything about it, it's a waste of time. So we need to be able to educate the nursing staff as well as the clinicians that it's not okay to see something and do nothing about it. That makes complete sense. Um, there is just a question here, and I did want to just confirm. Anna's just asked if you're okay with us sharing the slides after the webinar. So we are. We did record it, um, and you are okay with us sharing that with our members? Yes. Yes, I am. Wonderful. And then Aaron has asked um, your for your thoughts on Remy fentanyl as an alternative to agents with prolonged context sensitive half lives. Uh, when, I, when, when Remy Fentanyl first came out, uh, I, I was in Seattle at the time, and Arthur Lamb, who used to be the, the head of the ICU there, he said, I hate Remy Fentanyl. So why do you hate Remy Fentanyl? He says, because the patients wake up with the good resident, and the patients wake up with the rubbish resident. I can't tell who's good and who's bad. Because you switch it off, they all wake up. And Remy Fentanyl has become a really uh, a mainstay a drug for us, because we tend to put people on Remy Fentanyl for tube tolerance. If we want to stop their wake up, wake them up. But, but Remy fentanyl has really got very little anxiolytic activity, and it really is a very powerful uh, analgesic, and it works very well. And sometimes two mils of Remy fentanyl can be an hour, can be the difference between having a patient who's tolerating the ventilator and completely fighting out the ventilator. So most of our neurologic patients, most of our patients who are going to, we're going to extubate in the next day or two, we use Remy fentanyl. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Christopher is asking, are there any specific problems with COVID-19 since emboli embolic events are a factor in some people? Yes, they really are. I have been arguing for this for a long time. The trouble is uh, most inflammatory disease, most ARDS cause a thrombosis of some sort or another. IL-6 goes up, uh, the dimer goes up, and that's part of the inflammatory process. There is something very strange about COVID in that we, we are seeing uh, on CTPA, on perfusion scans, approximately 25% incidence of pulmonary embolism. And these are multiple small pulmonary embolism everywhere. Now, I'm sure a lot of it is due to inflammation around the vessel rather than clots themselves. But in unpublished data, uh, we have seen an incidence of 50% of DVTs in post mortem specimens in COVID. So there is also. Uh, deep venous thrombosis, we're just not detecting it. So just because it's inflammatory thrombosis does not mean your platelets are more sticky, and it doesn't mean that you're not prone to developing uh, coagulation problems everywhere else. So most of us, uh, our unit in intensive, we've upped the dose of, of uh, heparin, actually, or uh, that we give prophylactically. And interestingly enough, in COVID patients or in uh, inflammatory disease patients, the sensitivity to heparin is much reduced. So in our population, they're only as effective, 70% effective, as opposed to being 100% effective. So if you think about it, 
giving one dose of Delta Par in a 5,000 once a day is only 70% effective. And actually, most of the time, it underdoses most patients. So we've gone to BD doses uh, 5,000 uh, uh, Delta Par in twice a day, uh, you know, 5,000 BD. That's very interesting. <clears throat> and are and you also, finding? And also, and also, let me add one more thing. What's the traditional, the traditional treatment for ARDS is run them dry, run them as dry as possible. What happens when you run patients dry? You run the risk of thrombosis. You increase the risk of thrombosis. You increase the risk of renal failure. So a lot of these patients got treated worldwide as if they are ARDS from day one. They run them dry and didn't watch out for the thrombosis as much as we should have maybe. And that's been a double whammy. And if you develop renal failure and ARDS, the mortality is really 70, 80%. It's incredible. <clears throat> um, we'll just move down to Kathleen's and I'm gonna come back to a question I have, but um, if you reach a point where you're running short of monitors, how do you prioritize who you will use the non-volt um, monitors for? Well, uh, are, are you saying if I have only a limited number of monitors? Mm -hmm. I believe what Kathleen's saying is yes. How would you choose who to prioritize these particular monitors for if you only had a few of them? Yeah, this is like saying, uh, uh, you know, we want to we want to have a, a five preventable deaths a year. Which five patients would you choose? It's really difficult to do that. You, it, it's impossible to have an algorithm for this. So a patient who comes in who's you know 27, 28, who has multiple bone fractures chest injuries being ventilated, uh, they, may, they are at risk of developing brain ischemia just as much as a 50-year-old or 60-year-old who's come in with, with some other disease. So for us, uh, if you want to monitor that, every, every bed space should have it. That's my view, unless they are awake and able to be assessed neurologically. It's like, it's like if you like monitoring oxygenation on the ward. So if you look at uh, patient safety net or Massimo safety net, if you monitor oxygenation on the wards, we're seeing COVID patients desaturating and, 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 uh, and intermittent oximetry measurements doesn't pick them up. A lot of patients are desaturating in the 70s uh, uh, and during the sleep, uh, in, in, uh, in the afternoons, uh, and it's not being picked up because they're being measured four or five times a day as opposed to continuously. So continuous monitoring is where you pick up the real uh, dips in saturation and oxygenation. <laughs> So maybe not related to this, but just uh, branching off of that question there, if there's any other questions people want to ask, feel free to put them in. But um, you did mention earlier that you're not moving towards uh, non-invasive strategies on your, your wards where you are. Um, what are you doing for people that are reliant on nocturnal CPAP? Uh, I'm not a respiratory physician, so, uh, so I don't look after patients who need nocturnal CPAP. But to me, uh, there is no logical reason uh, not to use continuous oxygenation monitoring on patients who use nocturnal CPAP uh, because, because the desaturation episodes are just as frequent whether you monitor them or not. And so knowing is always better than not knowing. And you may find actually that, that they desaturate, but it doesn't affect them and they're perfectly fit and well the next day. But you might find actually they desaturate and they are driving lorries the next day and they're very tired and at risk of crashing the car. So I, I believe that knowing is always better than not knowing. And then circling back to uh, the discussion regarding the, the clots and the depth of sedation, do you find that since integrating this technology into your intensive care unit, you've been able to mobilize patients sooner and get them moving, uh, getting them off the ventilator because you're not over sedating them for prolonged periods of time? It's not scientific. I haven't done it scientifically, but people have done it scientifically. So, so uh, you know, the Italian guys have done it uh, and shown that length of uh, stay reduces. Uh, Andre de Nolte in Canada, in Montreal, has done it and showed that length of stay reduces in cardiac patients. So, yes, the evidence is all there. If you don't over-sedate them, then they do have a shorter length of stay. They come off the ventilators quicker. In fact, the Be Aware trial showed that, that they get extubated quicker if you have a protocol-driven as opposed to uh, a non-protocol-driven sedation. Okay, I'm just looking to see if there's any more questions that are coming out of the um, viewers, but I think you did such a great job of explaining everything, and your slides were so wonderful. 
that I don't see any additional ones. Oh, hang on. Thank you. My apologies. Sarah does have a question here, I believe. I can get that. Great. Okay. Uh, Dr. Maddox, can you please comment on if this type of technology has decreased the use of sedation drugs overall? I think that's probably what I just asked you. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we are using a lot less propofol. We are using a lot less sedatives with the use of this technology. I use it every day. I show, pay, I show the nurses every day. So, you know, you're in birth suppression. You don't need to be on. So what happens is, here's what happens. Patients uh, move. So what do you do? You give them more prep fall because you don't want them to move. Okay, so you're now on 10 mils of prep fall an hour of 2%. Not a big, big dose, right? And then you've got fentanyl running. And then you've got uh, maybe, uh, and then what do you have to do? You have to give them some uh, inotropes to support the blood pressure. So they don't know adrenaline and the intervascular compartment shrinks. So you turn the prep fall down to, to eight and suddenly the blood pressure uh, increases. So you turn the no adrenaline down. It becomes a complete... Uh, juggling act of uh, inotropes, sedation, prep for all the rest of it, synchrony with the ventilator. So if you have a measure of sedation, which is what you're trying to do, you almost always reduce less prep for. In theater, in the operating theater, pe most people don't realize that a 20 mil of prep for injected rapidly can put you into birth suppression. And when you have an EEG on, ensure the residents that when you inject 20 mils of prep for fast, even a 25-year-old can go into birth suppression. They're astonished. Does that answer the question? Absolutely, that's uh, great. So, have there have there been anybody? I mean, given the shortage, given the bursts that we've had of COVID patients in certain areas of the world um, that are using this technology, I'm thinking maybe Italy, for example. Has there been situations where they've put the probe on multiple patients and they've just been moving the monitor uh, around as they've been trying to conserve? Uh, sedation and they've been trying to use the resources as appropriate, or do you really need to leave it on one patient continuously, continuously in order to get the optimal effect? And I know this is probably going into selling monitors and such, but just out of curiosity, is that an approach that may be feasible if you're really in a crunch trying to weigh everything out? Well, uh, the interesting thing about this is actually, unless I'm mistaken and, and Kelly might be able to, uh, Becky, sorry, we may be able to, to correct me on this. Actually, uh, the, the monitors themselves aren't the cost. If you if you buy the sensors, you normally can get the monitors. So if you buy enough sensors for three beds, you can have three monitors. I don't think it's an issue. We haven't moved the monitors around uh, because of need, but because we were studying different patients. Uh, most ICUs tend to equip the ICU, and they say, look, we're going to need 10, 10 monitors, and they tend to get 10 sensors for 10 monitors. So our general intensive care has got 10 monitors, the one for 10 patients, but they don't move them from one patient to the next. Because the, you know, the, not the expensive bit, but the bit that you have to replace is the sensor. So once you've replaced the sensor, you know, if you use enough sensors, you can have enough machines. Maybe Becky can correct me on this if I'm not, if I'm not correct. Um, yeah, we have, we certainly have done that. I, I think it's uh, sometimes just what is negotiated with the facility based on the clinician's desire for how they want to use the devices. Um, we've certainly done that in Ontario with sites that uh, know that they're going to change their practice and do continuous monitoring. I think having uh, exactly what Dr. Mata said about spot check, the continuous trend is always more valuable than just spot check by itself, especially when uh, having continuous EEG monitoring can alert you to sudden changes in your patients that you may otherwise miss simply by doing spot checks. It also is incredibly valuable to have the continuous trend for the nurses for the nurses to titrate their meds. So if they're doing um, an objective sedation assess, uh, assessment on top of having the continuous EEG, it certainly helps them validate what they're seeing in their patient and also help optimize sedation. So it helps them individualize what they're giving to the patient. And everybody's response is so different. So continuous tends to be the most desirable way to do this. However, you technically could do spot check, but the value would be lost um, and the visibility into what's happening with your patient would be lost. But yes, Dr. Mata is correct. We have done that before with sites where they get to um, sort of present their business case to Massimo for what, what they want to do. And Massimo is always very helpful in helping them uh, get what they need for their patients. Um, because there is the consumable piece, the sensor that is disposable, but then the, the device itself that would stay at the bedside. So yes, we can do that. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions coming in at the moment. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys so much. I'll put my camera on now. Apologize. I'm trying to put two monitors here. You can see me. I can't see me, but you can see me. We can see you. We can see you. Can I, can I just say one, one last thing before I go? Um, it's going to become quite difficult for, for us as clinicians and the nurses and you guys to stand in front of a patient and family and when they say to you, and patients are getting more and more informed, what are you doing to monitor my brain? You know, it's going to be difficult to say nothing. You know, mm -hmm. coming around sooner or later, we're going to have to justify why we're not using a non-invasive 35 buck sensor on the forehead on a day in ICU is costing anything between $3,000 and $20,000. You know, the people are going to be asking, why aren't you monitoring my brain? And I do some medical legal work and I got my first medical legal case last week that talks about developing delirium post-surgery and their family is sitting. And, you know, you look through it all and you go, actually, it's pretty standard practice, but people are becoming more and more aware of the fact that actually, if I'm 70 or I'm 80 and I'm a professor in Cambridge and I do humanities, I don't want to lose my ability to keep doing this when I have my hip replaced. So it's not about surviving your operation is not enough anymore. Surviving your cardiac surgery is not enough. You don't fly an airline because it doesn't crash anymore. There are many other things you look for in an airline. And the same thing for anesthesia, elective surgery and intensive care now. Surviving the disease is not enough. Patients are asking for more. Mm, that's good. That's so true. And sorry, what was the lower age threshold or size threshold for this device? I think there's there's neonatal sensors, uh, so there are even there's pediatric ones and there's neonatal ones being being uh, validated at the moment going through the FDA. Okay. Yeah. So in in Canada we have um, neonatal, pediatric, and adult. The lower age for the adult sensor is 18 years of age, and that's because the algorithm is based on the neural development of an adult brain. So that's why there's an age range. Um, but there is pediatric and neonatal for those sites that do have multiple patient populations come through their ICU. And just based on the litigation piece that was just mentioned, is that data flowed into an EMR? Yes. Yes. Yes, all the data can flow into all your EMRs. It's, uh, it's integrated in everything. We integrate it into our EMR, so it's no problem. We have Epic, so. Oh, so do we. We have told chat later, yeah. friend. Yeah. Okay. And actually, and actually, yeah. if you want to go the step further, uh, you would have an Iris platform, which which allows you to interrogate the data both ways, going into the MR and coming back. The problem with Epic is, if you want to integrate data afterwards, you have to go through the Clarity server and send a request and get the data out, and it's not dynamic. So, so the beauty of the Iris server is that you don't have to do that. You can just, it's a two-way communication system with the MR, and you can analyze the data before it goes in or after it's going. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today and for Pleasure. sharing. Thank you. Really thank you, guys. Um, for being able to bring, uh, connect us with um, the speaker. And just a final thank you to all the RTs out there for joining us today, for keeping yourselves informed, for making sure that you're doing everything that you're doing for our patients and our community and our families. You're all amazing. And thank you for supporting the RTSO because without you, we're not able to move forward uh, with our profession and to represent so if you're not already an RTSO member, please consider. Thank you to Massimo for becoming a corporate sponsor. And we do have another webinar on Thursday, which is about home care. Have a great day, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Bye now. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. bye.